Now, Matthew 25 and verse 14. Before I start to read it, I'm going to read a little bit of it to you. Before I do, I just want to give you a background on it. For the last two, three weeks, this verse just keeps standing up in front of me. And I've, I've just so drawn to it, and I've been reading it and looking at it. And just like how many of you would say you never really heard anybody preach about Adam was standing there silent? How many of you know that's, that's just one of those things you don't hear a lot about? Well, today I'm going to talk to you about some things. I, it, it's important to hear it because this scripture, I'm looking at this thing, and it starts coming alive. It starts opening up. Matthew 25, verse 14. Now, for it is like a man who was about to take a journey, <clears throat> and he called his servants together and trusted them with his property. The man's property, okay, is his property. Wasn't theirs, it's his. And uh, he called the servants, verse 15, to one he gave five talents, probably about 5,000, to another two, and to another one. So there are three characters here, <clears throat> and all three of these characters have an opportunity. All three of these characters have an opportunity to do something. Are you watching this? All right. And he says uh, to each in proportion to his own that he gave it to, personal ability. In other words, he gave five uh, talents to one guy because this guy had the ability to handle five. How many of you here? See, God doesn't give somebody $5,000 when you can't handle $5. And the church through uh, all the big uh, pontifications, of, pontifications of, of preaching that have gone on through the uh, great uh, orators that have taken the word and stretched it uh, beyond the boundary of, of being biblically sound they have preached doctrines that said everybody is going to get rich. Everybody's not. Hello. And look at the Bible. The Bible divides up things. Not everybody's going to prophesy. Should all desire to, but not everybody will. Not everybody's going to be a prophet. Not everybody's going to be evangelist. We all should do the work of evangelists, but not all are going to. Are you hearing me? And we need to understand that because when the, the Bible and, and preachers preach a message that puts us in the generic generalization of inclusiveness, we have to be careful because just because it says, I can be blessed, don't mean you are going to get blessed. Because if you don't have an appropriation, if you don't have a participation, if you don't have something you're yielding to in that, I could tell you all day long that you're supposed to be praying and the righteous prayer of the righteous avails much. But if you never pray, none of that means a lick of anything. Hello? I can tell you, you can win a soul to the Lord, but if you never do it, then that's just nothing. That's emptiness. Are you hearing me today? So every bit of God's word comes with a prerequisition. It comes with a responsibility. Come on. How many of you know it's that way in marriage? I could pronounce over you, you're going to have a blessed marriage. Not true. Because there are caveats. There are prerequisitions. There are requirements for that to happen. I could tell you you're going to go to heaven. Ain't true either. That's why I don't want ever want our people saying to people when they come down here, you're saved. The person who comes down has to declare that, not the counselor. If the counselor says you're saved, then that means they're going to walk with you, hold your hand, and when you fall, they're going to be accountable. So you have to see the word from the perspective that the word is absolutely true. And the word does include all. But because uh, God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him would be saved, isn't there a prerequisite? Who can be saved? Those that believe. 
So you got to believe, you got to hear this today, because everything that we do in Christ has a prerequisition. It has a responsibility connected to it. And the church is like the culture. It wants all the delicacies and pleasures with no responsibility. Hello. I want all the drapings of all the blessings. It's like people, you know, come up and look at your car. You got a nice car or something. They look at it and say, oh, man, I, you know, I'm going to give me one of them. How did you get that? Well, I prayed. And the Lord blessed me. Shut up. That car fell out of heaven. I don't want to live near you. <laughs> Cars will be dropping out. Hello? How do you know you got a nice car? Because you worked. Are you hearing me today? Yeah. And we need to get that. We need to understand that to the fullness of that because if we do, then we start hearing the word and decide to apply the word. But we live in a time, a culture that does not have to apply anything it hears. Let's go further. So it said here, he left the country. Verse 16, he who had received the five talents went on uh, went at once and traded with them and he gained five talents more. And likewise, he who had received the two talents, he also gained two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, not after, uh, not too long, uh, after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came and brought him five more, saying, Master, you entrusted to me five talents. See here, I have gained five talents more. His master said to him, Well done. You upright, honorable, admirable, faithful servant. You have been faithful and trustworthy over a little. Keep watching this. You're faithful with a little. You're faithful with a little. How many hear that? How many times have I prayed with people, told me some of the greatest lies I've ever heard? My God, I'm going to get blessed. I'm going to be a millionaire. No, they're not. Not there talking to me, you ain't. You got to do some things. Hello? You got to do some things. Now, it said here, in verse 21, you've been faithful and trustworthy with a little. I'll put you in charge of much. Now, look at the man did. The master, he shifted from making money and he gave him a job. He gave him a position. He moved him into a position once he showed he could handle the money. Watch it. It says right here, I'll put you in charge of much. So all of a sudden we're talking about taking 5,000 or talent, five talent. We're taking that and we go and we invest it and we make some more. And the man comes back and he likes what we did. So he says, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to put you over a whole bunch of my companies. Wow. How I many you know promotion does come from the Lord? Hello. Verse 22. And he also who had the two talents came forward saying, Master, you entrusted the two talents to me and I have gained two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, you upright, honorable, admirable, and faithful servant. You have been faithful and trustworthy over a little. Here you go again. I will put you in charge of much. So number two, this guy gets another job setting. But how I many you know his job wasn't like the $5 job? Hello, the five talent job was a little bit better than the two talent job. But he still got promoted. Come on. Have you want to be promoted? All right, here you go. There it is. And he says, uh, uh, his master said to him, well done. So I put you in charge of much. Enter into and share the joy. Come on. Both of them. Enter into and share the joy, the delight, the blessedness that your master enjoys. Both of them were told... Uh, that they could enjoy the same joy that the man who gave them the resource has enjoyed. See, now that takes you to a whole nother level. Because, you know, you've been there working. You're not driving the Bentley. See, but the owner's driving up in his nice Bentley or some other. And he's driving up in that Bentley 
and you ain't driving in the Bentley. But now he's moved you up. He gave you much. He's promoted you. So now you can own the Bentley. Because it says you're going to have the same joy he has. All right, let's look at it this way. The joy that that man had was that his field had multiplied. And the joy that he had was that his worker, his servant, was really good and trustworthy. So you're going to have the same attitude. You're going to hang out with people that are different. You're going to change uh, the environment you're living in because now you're hanging out with the $5 people. Can I, can I use 5 and $2 just to help? But that's all right because he's going to give you much more. And the joy that the owner has is going to be your joy. How do you want to have Jesus' joy? The joy that he has, the victory that he has, I want that victory in my life. Isn't that right? When you see somebody that's blessed and somebody that's honored the Lord and done right, you say, I see that and I like that. I'd like to be able to do that. So number five guy says to his wife, come on, sweetheart, we're going. We're going down to the Nile. And we're going to take us a little vacation. I rented a condo right on the water. We're going to go down there and we're going to hang out. And the kids can play in the pool. And I, I got a little separate little fishing trip set up. We're going to have fun. Now, lo and behold, they get there. You know who's there? The owner's there. See, Jesus said, where I am, my servants will be also. Now, you got to get it in the natural because I'm going to move you into the spiritual. So they all go down to the Nile and they got the condo. Now, you know, the master, he got the executive suite. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. And, but you got one that's near and sees the Nile. Wow. Now, number two, he's there too. And he's got his kids. And they're just all happy as bugs, man. They're just having a good old time. Right? Where my servants are, there am I also. Let's, let's, let's look at number one. You know who I'm talking about number one now? Number one dollar. He who had received one dollar, one talent, also came forward saying, Master, I know you to be a harsh. Now look at this. He don't start out by blessing the man. He starts out by blaming him. You see, that's like a Christian coming to God and say, mm -hmm, I saw you blessing Brother Antonio, but, you know, I understand. See, you're starting off in a negative. See, people that are living under a spirit of poverty always start with a negative statement. Can't, won't happen to me. You start off negative. So you get no mercy because you already killed your future. You see, if he had any sense at all, he just said, look, you know, I, I know you, you, you work hard. You make people do what they, you know, and, and, and I, just, I, I just need mercy here. Maybe something would have happened. But instead he turns out and says, I'm going to blame you. <laughs> you see, I'm afraid. I know you harsh, hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you did not winnowed. That means uh, sifting for the grain. So I was afraid. Oh, I love it when I hear Christians say, well, I'd like to, but I'm afraid. I'd like to move in God, but I'm afraid. Okay? I'm afraid. So he said, I'm afraid. I went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, fool, just because you're afraid, don't hide my money. You be afraid for your own money, but don't hide my money. Now he's got the owner mad. Are you listening to me? See, he ain't, number one ain't going to the Nile. He's in denial. He ain't going to the Nile. He's in denial. <laughs> Watch it. Watch it. So I was afraid and I went and hid the talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. I dug it up. So he, he hands this guy this old, dirty, mill, mildewed, smelling money covered with dirt. A few worms drop off of it. And he hands it back to him. Now, don't you know that the master did not give him that talent that way? 
He didn't give it covered up in dirt. He didn't give it out of the ground. He gave that man that talent with it nice and shiny. And that uh, money was right there, right outside. It was clean. But you went and buried it. You contaminated it. You see, that's what a lot of Christians do. They take the good thing that God gives them and they bury it in the earth. And they bury it in this earthen vessel till it gets contaminated. And when the master comes, they offer him back something out of flesh. Because the Bible says that no flesh shall glory in the presence of God. So all of a sudden, when it's all time and the master shows up like the ten virgins, when the man came back, you know it's the Lord. And so here's the Lord. He's the master. He's coming back. And you buried it in your soul, and your soul is contaminated. Now, notice that from verse uh, 24, he gave more attention to this fella than he did to the others. You see, a lot of times, blessing is easy to handle when it comes from the master. But when the master wants to deal with you, he's going to take time. And he says in verse 26, but his master answered him, you wicked and lazy and idle servant. Did you indeed know that I reap where uh, I have not sowed and gather grain where I have not widowed? then you uh, should have invested my money in with the bankers and at my coming, I would have received what was my own uh, interest, with interest. So take the talent away from him and give it to number five. He's got 10, give it to him. How of you know the one that has is always gonna get more? The one that has is always gonna get more, saints. See, when you're in the mentality of the not having, you'll always not have. But when you're in the mentality of having, you'll always have. See, money, money is funny. When you run after money, it has wings, Proverbs says, and flies away. I don't ever chase money, but money chases me. I don't have to run it down. It's after me. Money's coming, pressed down, shaking together. It's looking for me. Because I'm always saying what I need to be saying. I'm always looking for what he wants to do with that. And when he gives me, I invest what he gives me so that there's more. And I keep giving more back to him. He just keeps giving more to me. Wow. Take it away. For to everyone who uh, has will be given, more will be given. Verse 29. And he will be furnished richly so that uh, he will have abundance. But the one who does not have, even what he does have will be taken away. I mean, you know, the poor don't get richer. They just get poorer. Poor just get, how many of you know when you don't have any money and you invest nothing, what do you get? You just get the nothing. And some of the people of God, all they ever do is give nothing in the house of God and they never get anything. And they stay that way. And they'll give it to their children and their children's children and they'll reproduce poverty to another generation. I have it here. How many of you know, saints, you can ride downtown and you can stop at some of the houses down there and you can talk to people and they'll tell you, well, my mother lived here and now I live here and my children live here and my children's children live here. Yeah, we have rats and yeah, we don't pay it. We don't have our electric on all the time and yeah, we got holes in the wall and we're just going to pass that on. We're going to keep helping our kids. Because you pass on poverty. How do you know now, number one and number two have been in the Nile with the master having a good old vacation. Number one, where did he end up? But from the one who does not have, even what he does have be taken and throw that good for nothing servant into the outer darkness. There there will be weeping and grinding of teeth. Good Lord. He ain't at the Nile. He ain't at the condo. He ain't enjoying the Hilton and the pool. He ain't got his light bill on. <laughs> it says outer darkness. I mean, he ain't paying his light bill. 
He's somewhere huddled up in his little poor poverty mindset, and he ain't got nothing. Now, we understand that means also that you send him to hell. But let me take you somewhere. This is all through the Bible. Look at Joshua 24, verse 13. I have given you, Joshua 24, verse 13. I have given you a land for which you did not labor and cities you did not build. And you dwell in them, you eat from the vineyards and olive yards you did not plant. You see, part of God's plan is to bless us uh, even where we didn't sow. Come on. He told Joshua, he said, look, I'm going to bless you so that the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. And they're going to give back to you. They're going to bless you. See, but when you got a poverty mentality, you're stealing. God has no results, no opportunity but to curse you. He has no choice to put you in outer darkness. You mark what I tell you. The same Christian that sits in the house of God today who will not break this off of their life, in 10 years, they'll still be poor. They'll still be with their hand out. They'll still be wanting Jesus to do something. They'll still be wanting some blessing. And they'll recycle themselves. And they'll be the same Christian since the 10 years past. I've been in church for 45 years. I have watched the same poor-minded people live in the same way. I see them once in a while. I'm riding somewhere, somebody come up, hey, Brother Bard, how you doing? Good. Man, Brother Bard, you don't look like you've aged a bit. Well, thank you. You look like you've aged three times. I even said to one guy, came to me, looked at him, he said, man, Brother Bard, you look so good. I said, man, you don't. And I said to him, I said, you know why I look good? Because unlike you, I, I, I haven't stopped serving the Lord. Oh, my God, Brother Bob, why do you say that? Well, because I don't want to be politically correct while he's burning in hell. Because I'm going to give him a warning before we all depart. And I'm going to take a minute and say, you know what? Poverty is no blessing. You want to get changed, get back in the house of God and give your life to the Lord and serve the Lord. And let God show you that he is good. Or either you buy into that little lie that you've created to make yourself feel comfortable and you sit there in your rottenness and you'll be not at the now. You can live in the now, but you won't be at the now. Come on. So it's in Joshua. The same, very same scripture is in Joshua in the Old Testament, it's in the New. Psalm 37 verse 4, delight yourself also in the Lord and he'll give you the desires or the secret petitions of your heart. Oh, you got to get that now. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires or the secret petitions of your heart. Now, this is really important that you get that, because I'm going to take you into that for a minute right here. In this story, we see three men who each were given a portion or responsibility. Verse 15, and then verse 20, 21. We saw the results. That's the $5 man. Verse 16, 22 through 23, we saw the results. And the same results now, I put you in charge of much, enter into the joy that their master experiences. So both, number five, number two, they both received the blessing of the, of the Lord. Come on, you agree with that? Yeah. And then verse 17, and you see that's the man with one. And the verse 24 through 27, he got the results. He didn't get any blessing. He got no joy. He got put in outer darkness. Now notice that the first two, were made rulers. I, I said that a minute ago. And he put in charge of much. Notice also he invited and gave them that joy. Now, being faithful with the little, the insignificant with the little, come on, that insignificant thing allows God to trust you with greater things. I want to tell you something. You got to come with me now. I just read it to you a minute ago. I just read it to you. It says here very clearly, Delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires or the secret petitions of your heart. Here's the problem, saints. 
Those two fellows, number five and number two, they delighted in the Lord even though they knew that he was a hard man and that he would demand things and that he, you know, had them sow where they uh, reap where they didn't, he rep where he didn't sow, all that. But they just loved him. They just accepted it. They just said, Lord, we thank you for the blessing. Now, notice that the first two did this. Isn't it amazing when you're faithful with a little and you make the little insignificant thing great, how God will bless you? Oh, you've got to hear me today. Isn't it amazing when we see the great men and women of Scripture, we find them in their small insignificant assignments? Let's back the story up a minute. We got farmers, we got people talking about crops. He got five talents. He got Daenerys. Okay, could have been five thousand dollars, it's estimated, for the first guy. And he's probably gotten hold of some people who trade money and trade product. And he's got some sheep and some I got some corn, you got some sheep, and here's some donkeys and here's some camels. And this guy's moving this thing around because he's gonna get some money. I get this. And in that process. If you look in the Bible, we find people in Scripture, we find them in the small, insignificant assignment. And I want to tell you something. This man had, these three men had a test. And the test was their assignment. And the assignment was what God was going to prove whether or not they were real. How many of you know God gives all of us insignificant assignments not because we can handle the bigger ones because we can't so he starts off and gives us the insignificant assignment and usually we complain about it we gripe about it we 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 bury it in the soul of our being and nothing gets multiplied you listening you delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart, but he'll start you. How about Abraham and how about Moses? These were people that were sheep herders. These were people that, that uh, and even Moses, it won't hit sheep. It was his father-in-law's sheep. <clears throat> we meet men in the Bible and women in the Bible who are in the low place. They're in the lowly place. Are you hearing me? And God is trying to prove them and say, can you handle being in the low place? Can you handle being in that insignificant spot? Donnie Mears, who has that cathedral I mentioned, he started out as the janitor of a little church in Washington, D.C. that held about 1,000 people. And now it's a big, giant, mega church. And he was the janitor. Hello. Kenneth Copeland was the pilot for Oral Roberts. Hello. And, and Dr. Yungi Cho, the 700,000 plus church, he was the missionary interpreter for a friend of ours up in New York who's a pastor. That's all he was. He was just an interpreter. He went to meetings and he interpreted. Isn't that right, Casey? And that's how God took him in his assignment and said, let's see if I can trust him. I'm going to give him five or I'm going to give him two or I'm going to give him one. Let's see what he does with it. Do you know how many of God's people have been given the talent of God's opportunity in the small, insignificant, and they have failed because they didn't give any return back to God. Are you still listening? How about Nehemiah? Nehemiah in the Old Testament, what was he? He was a cupbearer. Let me tell you something about a cupbearer. He was a cupbearer to the king. <laughs> Artemis and or Arterexus. And he was the king. And 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 Nehemiah was the cupbearer. That meant that the king never took a chalice of wine and drank it till Nehemiah was forced to drink it first. So that all the enemies of the king, if they had poisoned uh, his cup, Nehemiah drops dead. 
How many know Nehemiah had room to complain about that assignment? <laughs> Hello. He could have said, you know, I don't like this assignment. But see, when you've been faithful in your assignment, even in sin- insignificant spots, is when God can say, I'm going to give you much more. I'm going to give you much more. You're going to have joy like the master, like Jesus has. I'm going to make you so that you are blessed going out coming in. Are you listening? I watch it all the time. I watch people in the church. I watch Ruth in the Bible. She's a slave servant. She's working the corners of the field where the slaves would get their their leftovers from the Jewish people. They had the corners of the field they were reaping. Yet she ends up marrying Boaz. Wow. And Boaz is a type of Jesus. Ruth is like a type of the church. And she served in the low spot and God brought her to the high spot. Come on, saints. And every one of us as Christians, we get these assignments as God gives us, like cut the grass. And we get a little spot that we're out there cutting, and we're weeding, whacking, and we're cutting that little spot of our grass. And we're singing hallelujah. Hot today. Bugs everywhere. And then the Lord comes. And says, come here, I I, I want, I require, give me back what I gave you. And you give him back more than what he gave you. And all of a sudden he says, come on, I'm going to give you more now. I'm going to make you ruler. You're going to be over all the cut grass guys. You see, God in church life, he gives us assignments. And he puts us in areas. Let me help you with something. God doesn't put you always in the area that you're the best at. Because you don't need God. Hello. He goes along and he finds a couple more like Elisha. Elisha's a mega farmer. He's got oxen running five rows deep. He's got like a combine. Man, he's back there running them oxen, boy. And Elisha walks back and throws the mantle on him. Takes those oxen, stops, cuts, them, cuts their throat, gets a bonfire. All of a sudden, all of his hundreds of laborers, he feeds them all. Leaves it. Where are you going? I'm going to be a prophet. Really? From a farmer to a prophet. Well, he runs into Elijah in Kings. What does Elijah do? He welcomes him. Now all the 50 prophets are right across the river over here. And they're all over there going, "Mm mm-hmm, I'm next. You see, watch this, he's going to call me. Who's that guy? Where'd he come from? Look at him. Oh, he smells like Ox manure. Look at his feet. Ah, who is this guy? So Elisha comes up. He's got this thing, this garment called a mantle. And he says to the prophet, I'm going to bring it back to you. The prophet says, well, thank you, son. Come right up in here. Fifty over there going, who does he think he is? He's getting closer. He gave us the one. (laughs) All of a sudden, something begins to happen. And a shift begins to go on. And Elisha goes from being an ox farmer, plower, to becoming one of the greatest prophets and does twice the miracles that Elijah did. And it was willing to get close to him. But you see, I love what Elijah does. Elijah said, you want to be, you want to be, you want this anointing? You want this anointing. Okay, here's what you're going to do. I, you know, young preachers and all come in. Oh, Bishop, you, want, uh, you know, I want this anointing. I want that preacher anointing. <laughs> no, you don't. If you do, he said this. He took him to seven cities. Read your Bible. Elijah took Elisha 
to seven cities, and here's what they did. He went backwards, and every one of them means something phenomenal. Every one of them is Gilgotha. He had to die. The skull. Every one of those places, Elisha took, Elijah took Elisha backwards to get him right. Have you here? Have you know his assignment? I'm going to be the prophet. He'd already sent out cards. He had posters made up. I mean, he was going on the circuit. And the man takes me backwards. When you got an arrow, you always go back before you go forward. In God, you always got to go back in humility so God can see if you're worth going to the Nile. You better get this today. Now look at this, look at this. You got Ruth, you got Nehemiah, you got all these people. And then, and then you got Peter, James, a couple of fishing boys. They're out there messing with the fish, little teeny spit. This is what they call it. They call it fish like this. <laughs> Drive me crazy. And <clears throat> my bait are bigger than that. My bait start out like this. You imagine the mouth that that eats? Hmm. Now, Peter and James, they're fishermen. And they, they turn into apostles. But have you know, three and a half years of walking with Jesus took time for them to become Apostle Peter. Hello? Little did they know they were marching to their own death. But you see, they were willing to take the assignment that was the lesser so that they could be faithful and they could do that assignment with all their heart and all their might and all their strength wholeheartedly as unto the Lord so promotion could come from the Lord. All we get today is people get an assignment and they got to do some project and, and, and the whole time they're doing it, they're complaining about it. Man. <clears throat> and then what they do is they end up doing it lousy. They just go ahead and say, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be doing this. You know, this is the only thing I can do in the church. So I'm going to do it lousy. And then when the reward time comes out, they're all ticked off when they get one. Or when they're fired. Or when they're put out. Lord. See, when I went to my church, Brother John did and you know, he didn't even know my name for a year. He called me Bert. And, 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 and you know, but I, I had tools. I could build anything. So I just built cabinets. I built things, hung doors, did stuff, you know. And back then, I used my talents all the time of, of that, so I, I stayed current. <laughs> and, man, I was always working, doing something around the church, you know. And he'd come by, hey. He asked me one day, he said, have you a brother? I said, no. He said, you sure? I said, no. He said, I would have swore I saw you somewhere else a little while ago. I said, yeah, well, I was on the roof repairing something. You down here now? I said, yeah. He said, okay. And then it came time one day, he came to me and said, listen, I want you to do this. You have blessed this church. You have fixed this, done that. This. He said, I want you to do, I want to put you in this. So he pushed me in another area. He gave my wife and I the, 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 the nursery ministry. And I ran the parking lot, me and two other knuckleheads. That's what we did. Nobody asked us to. They never had a parking lot ministry. But our church was growing like crazy. We had thousands coming to the church. So we did the parking lot. We had parked cars, man. And put them in there like this. We were hippies, you know. We were out there parking cars. People were looking, lock your doors. <laughs> and we'd say things like, can I help you with your kids? And they'd go, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, they looked at us like we we're going to take their babies and sneak off to Mexico. <laughs> and, and. You know, here we are, man, we're just out there. Somebody can't get the stuff, you know, can't get out. We're helping wheelchair stuff, you know. Man, we're just, sometimes we even took from uh, Windex and we'd clean the windshield off a little bit. You know, we would stop there having fun, man. We're laughing. Brother John came out one day. He's all dressed up. Hey, guys, come here. What are you guys doing out here? Oh, nothing. We're just parking cars. 
I heard that. You helping some women, you taking care of people, and you doing all that. Yeah. Who told you to do it? Nobody. Hmm. All right. And that went on and that went on and that went on. Then it came time to run the nursery. We ran the nursery. Then it came time. He said, I want you to move into Proclaim House. That was a house we had that had 20 some, 22, 23 men living downstairs. And Corley and I and my two little ones, we lived upstairs. And one of them is my bro brother-in-law. We led him to the Lord, helped him get discipled, and he's one of my brother-in-laws. And so we really did this thing. We were there day and night, day and night, day and night. <clears throat> Next thing you know, I want you to come on and be one of the pastors. I want you to build the building. I want you to be the pastor. I want you to be the head of all the pastors. I want you to be over the administration. I want you to. Next thing you know, man, I just kept saying, okay. He goes, I, you know, I gave you one, and you turned it into two. I gave you two. You turned it into four. I gave you five. You turned it into ten. Son, come on with me. Yet, here's the key. When I was doing the bad stuff, meaning the lowly stuff, like the day I was repairing the plumbing, and I'm outside, I dug a trench, put in the sewer line, because it had collapsed. So I'm out there, man, and I'm in my knees, on my knees, and I'm down in there, and I'm trying to line these pipes up, you know. Well, first I got to go tell everybody in the school, don't. Use the bathroom. So I put signs up, don't use the toilet. So I'm down there, man, and I got that thing almost lined up, and it just wouldn't work. So I had to dig some dirt. While I'm holding it like this, I'm digging the dirt with a little tool now. And, and all of a sudden, this little thing fell out in my hand. Oh! Disgusting! Boy, I came out of that hole. I came up out of that place, went into the boys' bathroom. Tape had been tore. I could tell it, you know. <clears throat> Pushed that door open. Here's this guy. He's about this high. <clears throat> He's about this wide. His little feet and legs didn't work together real. Well. <laughs> Brother Bart, how you doing? Praise the Lord. I didn't know I'd meet you in the bathroom. Did you just go to the bathroom? I went number two, Brother Bart. I said, yeah, I know you did. I found it. I said, get out of here, boy. So he left and went back out, get the pipe hung up. But see, you didn't hear me going around complaining or going around doing what I did half-baked. See, because I was so thankful that God had saved me. If all I ever did was dig ditches and hook pipes up, I'm going to be there today doing it with all my heart. Because I should be dead, but I'm alive. And my God did a miracle for me. But too many times, some of us get involved in some area of ministry. Got to clean the church. Yeah. Daggone church is so big the hallway. Come on. Matthew the tax collector, then a disciple, Paul the tent maker, a great apostle, Jesus the carpenter, becomes the Messiah. You don't hear any reports about him complaining. I've watched over the many years how I'm, now how, how, how God gives people assignments. They often are not the desires of their heart, but it is the Father's heart to trust you with a portion and an assignment that you don't even like. One that you do because you've been asked to do it. Hello? I asked, we asked, we hired Holly. She's a, uh, what would you play? Sports? What was it? All right, track and soccer. She's big time. She got hurt, but... College, want to go to college and play sports, all that stuff. And we got her out here digging in the dirt. And she's a pump, country pumpkin. She got to teach her to wear shoes. And so she's out there into flowers and she's doing all that. And she's mad at the deer because she planted them one day and the deer came the next night and ate them all. <laughs> <clears throat> but see, if she learns to be faithful, I told her we'd kill the deer and she'd like that idea. But anyway... <clears throat> if she learned to be faithful in that, how do you know one day she'll move from the one to the two and then to the two to the five and then one day she'll be rejoicing with the master. Yeah. 
See, when you do something for the Lord, if you don't get this right, you're going to end up in the one figure and you'll never get blessed. Look at it. We'll end here. Look at this. Mm. We do it because we've been asked. If you'd only see what the Father's trying to do with you through the undesirable assignment. Ephesians 1.18, Paul said he was praying for the Ephesians that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened. In other words, let them see what's behind the assignment. Father, teach us to see what's behind when we serve and we're on the camera or we're in the ushering or we're on the worship team. Let us see that the assignment is just our season of God proven to see if we're going to be able to be trusted with more. Mark, what I tell you, the ones who fail that test, they're never useful. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. He, for the joy of obtaining the prize that was set before him, endured the cross, despising and ignoring the shame. Mm -hmm. Jesus enjoyed his assignment. Can you hear that? Even though it was a cross. Wow. I've watched people, saints, lose their place. One day they were in God and they were thankful they could serve. And today they're nowhere. They're the critic. They let bitterness get in. And there's no life at all. Look at the Ephesians 5, 15th in the Message Bible. Can you get it? Message, uh, 15, verse, okay. So watch your step. <laughs> Use your head. Uh, that, we can stop right there. Make the most of every chance you get. These are desperate times. Go on. Don't live carelessly, unthinkingly. Make sure you understand what the master wants. Don't drink too much wine. Come on. That cheapens your life. Drink the spirit of God. Huge drafts of him. Come on. There's no doubt we're in a battle with the enemy, with every assignment. How many you know that every assignment comes with a, with a battle? I took a church over in North Carolina every weekend. Was it six months we went down there? Six months every weekend. A little city called Tarboro, North Carolina. Got a sign that says, welcome. On the back of it says, thank you for coming. <laughs> I baptized people in a, in a pond, a mud pond. And leeches got on us. They'd be coming up like this, and I'd see leeches on them. I'd, I'd pull them off so they wouldn't just freak right out. <laughs> Went up there. How would you like to go to this assignment? Here's my assignment. Brother John says, Bart, come see me. I'm going to send you to Tarboro, North Carolina. Okay, Brother John, what do you want me to do? There's a church there. Yeah, I know the church. Okay, you're going to go there and preach every weekend. Okay? No problem. Um, is there uh, anything happened or just, what, what's the deal? Uh, well, the pastor had an affair with one of the ladies in the church and her husband's a hunter and he got up Sunday morning with his hunting rifle and shot all the windows of their house out with a high powered rifle. And so the church is down to about 15 people. Thank you, Brother John. So I go there. People are weeping. People are mad. All kinds of action. So I just went, blinders on. Hallelujah. Started Friday night. Got them together. Prayed over them. Laid hands on them. Drove out demons, lying spirits, confusion, everything. Saturday all day long. Preach, teach, preach, teach. Work with the worship team. They had a good band, but they didn't have any people. I mean, they had like six people on the band, but then there was nobody in the audience. And so, man, I, I, I got that thing. We, we practiced and we worshiped on Saturday night. I taught first principles and then got up and preached all day, preached that night, got in the car, drove my kids and my little wife all the way back to Norfolk, Virginia Beach, Virginia, got up in the morning and had to work all day. 
I took that church from 15 to 120 people and gave one of our young men that church. I set him in. His name was Bill. I set Bill in there, and he became the pastor of that very successful church. Hello? You see, my assignment was my opportunity. Can you hear that? My assignment was my opportunity. Wake up. Can you hear that? Wake up. Whatever your hand is found to do, do it with all your might unto the Lord. Can you hear that? Here's the end. These are desperate times. Don't live careless. Can you hear? He wants a return on his investment into your life. Like Matthew 25. His, he deposits value in you. Amen. And he wants a, 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 a value back. So he gives you an insignificant assignment to see how you'll handle the small before he can give you the great. Even pain can be an assignment to see how you handle it. 2 Corinthians 4, 16, 19, 18. Don't lose heart, it says. Don't lose heart. Amplify says don't be discouraged. How do you know we need to not lose heart? We need to not lose heart. Don't lose heart in well-doing. Come on. Our assignments come with its own battleground. The enemy will come to assault you. He'll assault your heart. He'll try to bury you in disappointment, rage, anger, bitterness, hopelessness, despair, unforgiveness, rejection, and abandonment. He'll aggravate you and cause relationships to fall. He'll cause breaches to happen and push you into the line of betrayal. He wants you To get out, to stop, and give up. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Can you hear that today? Would you stand with me? Father, I thank you today for this word because this word is a prophetic word and this word is a challenging word. Look at me this morning. I mean, you know that oftentimes we get into our assignment. Let me help you here. It is the Lord that sets in the body as it pleases him. Promotion comes from the Lord. So God, oh, oh, oh. May I say this? The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Good woman, good man. So if God orders your steps and he puts you in an assignment, what you do with the assignment is going to determine the outcome of your future. If you take the assignment and you reject it and you get an attitude and you look at it, you criticize it, you do all that. God didn't hire you as a, as a critic. He came to see what you're going to do. There is nothing, there's nobody, I can't do it. I can't get help. I ain't got nobody again. That's not your assignment. All you got to do is show up. If God gives you that assignment, you show up. You hear this? But we fail and we lose our place. I have a friend, dear friend, and he's a pastor. His name is Vinny. And we grew up together. His wife, his kids, my kids. He needed a house. He stayed with us. We needed a house. We stayed with him. It, we were close. We got saved, same church. He went out in ministry. I went out in ministry. We were in the same body. We still are, are very close. And um, early on, Vinny one day was in the sanctuary and he was, had a little bag and he was picking up people's snot tissues, putting them in the bag. And I remember somebody coming to him and say, Vinny, what are you doing? He owned a construction company, had 25, 28 um, workers. At one time I worked for him. He built big homes, him and I and another guy, we built a senator, a home on the ocean, beautiful, big five story home with elevator and pools inside. I mean, we built this big thing. And Vinny was a great, great builder. 
and he's picking up these tissues. The person said, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? And he said, come here, come here. You got to know Vinny, he's a little crazy. Come here, let me show you. Our church was long and had windows down the side and they were stained glass. And at certain times, the light in, the, in, in noon or so would come right through the glass and shine on the floor. And he would say, look, look, watch, look, get the right light. Oh, look, look right here. And the light would hit those pieces of paper and sometimes it would land on a piece of chungum paper that had the tin foil. They don't do that anymore, I guess, do they? I, I don't chew. I don't chew, spit, and drink. Anyway. And so it'd be a little silver paper there. Well, the sun would hit it and it would sparkle. And then he said, these are my diamonds. He said, the Lord let me see that there's diamonds in here. And what he was saying was, my assignment is where my joy is and serving my master. Then it came time, Vinny was not going to pick up snot rags anymore. It was time to send him to the Eastern Shore and he started the Rock Church on the Eastern Shore. That was 40 some years ago. And it's still going today, great. Because he was willing to take his assignment and do it as unto the Lord with all his heart and all his might and all his strength. And then when it was time, God gave him another assignment. Can God give you a new assignment? Are you a five, two, or a one? Some of you, you misused your assignment. You missed it. God is merciful and God is gracious. And you need to pray, say, Lord, forgive me. I approached this wrong. Give me an assignment, Lord. I'll be willing to do it with all my heart and all my might. Can you hear me today? Yeah. Can I pray for you now? Father, I thank you today. Lord, we are a people that need to understand your ways. Your ways are not like our ways. They're far above our ways. And if we could only do like Ephesians said, if we could only see. So today, Lord, we repent if we've had that attitude and we come to you today in humility and say Lord my next assignment whatever it is I learned today I'm going to give you thanks we give thanks to you God that you would dare take a risk with my pitiful life and give me an assignment and when I'm dead and when I've gone I want the words to simply be, he finished his assignment. He finished his assignment, and he finished it well. Father, I thank you today. May we ask you right now to change some things in our lives. Turn us around, Lord. When assignments come, may we not despise them. When they come, may we see your hand in them. May we say, it is the hand of God that's given me this assignment. Come on, saints, pray with me. It is the hand of God that has given me. It is the hand of God that gave me an opportunity to be able to serve in the house of God, to be able to be faithful in the house of God. It is the hand of God that would dare reach down into this miserable soul of mine. And give me an assignment to handle something small. Because the big will never come till you're faithful with the little. Father, I thank you today. May this word grow in us. May it be alive in us. May we not leave it, leave it or dismiss it so easily today. And those that missed it today. May they somehow find it. May they somehow hear it. May they somehow get a reflection of it through the life of your people. May it become the reflection of an image of people that say, I heard the word. I heard the word like men heard the word yesterday and said, I will not be silent. I will not be passive. I will not let my passivity destroy my house and my wife, my children. I will not let the enemy Corrupt my assignment. 
I thank you for the block parties. I thank you for the CYA. I thank you for the things that you've given this church to do, the feeding of people. Come and clean the building and, and serve in so many ways, oh God. Thank you for the privilege uh, that, God, we get to put our hands uh, to the thing that you bless uh, and the thing that you call your place uh, of abide, uh, the house of God, the sanctuary of God. Thank you, Lord. Every time we sweep the floor or fix something, it's because it's assignment. Every time we get to plant a plant, it's an assignment. Every time we serve communion, it's an assignment. How you doing with your assignment today? Ask the Lord. Say, Lord, show me. How am I handling my assignment? And if you're not, it's a good day to get it right. Talk to God. While you do that, I'm going to pray. Father, in Jesus' name, all over this room, there are those here today, and they have not really come to the place of ever answering the assignment of giving their lives to you. But today, that can change. And if you're here today, you say, Pastor, I want to give my life to you. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to give my life to you, Lord. I want to give my life to you. Say, Pastor, thank you. I'm going to do that. I'm going to say, Lord, I want my life to belong to you. Thank you for that opportunity, Pastor, to pray that prayer. If you're praying that prayer right now, I want to pray with you. Standing right where you're at, if you're there, just slip your hand up. Say, Pastor, pray for me. I want that to be my prayer. You put your hand up so I can see it. And I'll pray with you all over, looking all over, okay? Put it up, okay? Yes, I see your hand. Yes, anybody else? Put your hand up. I'm going to pray for you. Just hold it up there so I can see it. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am, I see that hand back there. That's a sweet hand. Hold it up there, honey. I'm going to pray for you, sweetheart. Amen. Hold it up there. Amen. Hold it up there. Father, anybody else? Anybody else? I don't want to miss you. Here's what I want you to do. Would you make your way this way so we can pray with you? Just one more step. That's all it is. Just one more step forward so we can just agree with you and have somebody pray with you. Come this way right now. You raised your hand. Come, sweet. Sweetheart, come on, come on, come on. Get hooked up here. Thank you for this day. What a good day. Come on, it's a good day. Lord, I bless these that are coming. I bless this dear sweet lady. Oh, Lord, bless her today. It's always room and there's always time to rededicate and refresh ourselves in you, Lord. I thank you for this day. What a glorious moment, Lord. Isn't it wonderful? It's never too late to get things right. Blessings and blessings. Father, I pray right now, secure these things. Secure these desires and prayers. May these be the prayers of, of a heart that says, Lord, thank you. I thank you for changing me. I thank you for bringing me this far. And I thank you for my future's good, Lord, to serve you. Father, I pray for the church today that you'll help us understand this word. We'll go out of the house happy. We'll go out of the house and we'll share Christ with somebody. We'll invite people to come back to the house of God. And we'll remember how good the Lord is.